iglesia, hay otros que van llegando, hay que respetar el tiempo los que llegaron. Nada más quiero presentar, hoy tenemos el gusto de tener una actividad más de este punto de Monte Sinaí. Queremos agradecer acá a Juan Fernández Dai, que estamos aquí también, en el punto de del templo Charles Sinjá. Y nada más un minutito, tenemos acá a Jajá José Mitraji, la verdad yo tuve el gusto de conocerlo hace poco tiempo. Estuvimos este, checando los discos del Jajá, nosotros que checarlos, es muy famoso en Nueva York, tiene muchos seguidores. La verdad hoy nos dio una clase en el Talmud Torah, espectacular, y queremos escuchar sus palabras para poder, eh, para poder recibir toda esa transmisión que él pasa de una manera muy bonita. Mena, disculpa mi voz, Jajá José, de Jajá. El que quiera es traducción simultánea en español, aquí habrá de aparatitos, el que quiera tomar y él va a hablar en inglés. Thank you, Rabbi. Good evening, everyone. The topic of uh, the lecture tonight is the critical situation in the world in today's generation. Many people that are very young, so they do not know the way the world was 20 or 30 years ago. Either they were not born yet, or they were little children, so they really don't know. But the ones who are 40 and older, they know right away that in the last 30 years, the world went back in moral and ethic like more than a thousand years in one shot. Things that people do today, 30 or 40 years ago, many, many people did not even dream to do. The question is, what really happened? When we begin to look for reasons, we can find a lot of good reasons for it. For instance, technology, internet, Facebook, YouTube, media, television, the last 30 years, they started to occupy the world and they got into everyone's mind. So they designed the way that people will behave. And it's all about rating. And it's true, that's one of the major reasons. But it's not everything. The way to check how the world drops spiritually is not only to go and check the way the secular people behave. It's to check how the religious people behave. If you saw that all the religious people behave perfect and they the same like they used to be 50 years ago, then you say, okay, the problem, it's only the media. The problem is only Facebook. The problem is only those things. And the religious people do not touch it, the strong religious people. That's why they stay perfect. And the secular people went down a lot in the moral. But the problem is that it's not true. In reality, even people who don't have access to internet and Facebook and things like that, they're not what it used to be. If people check the way their grandparents used to be and the way they are today, we see that there's a huge difference between the way we live today or not. Let me give you some example of what I mean. I know. This is the first time I come to Mexico. But uh, I don't need more than a day or two to see where I came to. I went to Istanbul, never been there before. I spent two, three days with the Turkish Jews in Istanbul. I saw right away wonderful people. The truth is that I never believe that I will have another opportunity because I travel to different countries. I didn't believe that I'm going to have an opportunity to see Jews that are so nice and good, like you say here, muchas bueno, mucho bueno, bueno, <laughs> muy bueno. Like, I never believed that I'm going to meet people in that level. I thought to myself, that's probably the highest that you get. I'm not talking about religion. 
I'm talking about behaving, דרך ארץ, manners, respect, good heart. This is what I'm talking about. This even someone without uh, Torah can have. Depend on the nature of a person. I didn't believe I'm going to have an opportunity to see this until I came here. When I came here, I saw a few very interesting things over here that you don't see in the rest of the world. You don't see it in America, you don't see it in Europe, you don't see it in Israel, you don't see it in many places I went to. First of all, everyone is extra, extra polite. Everyone is friendly, everyone right away wants to help. Everyone has manners. Not only that, there's no dirty politics. Everywhere you go today, the Satan is a genius. He got to the most religious communities in the world and started to make fights and politics between big people until it destroyed the communities completely. And then you come to a community that is not as religious, maybe, but the people live in brotherhood. And peace, in the eyes of God, it's something very, very important. Just as much as to keep Shabbat, and to be modest, and to eat kosher, and all the rest of the laws of the Torah. Gadol HaShalom, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in the Torah, you're not allowed to erase my name. If you write mezuzah, if you write Sefer Torah, if you write filin, if you made a mistake in, sefer, in uh, tefillin, in mezuzah. Sefer Torah, if you made a mistake, you can take the piece out, fix the mistake, and put it back. Because Sefer Torah, there's no obligation to write it in the right order, because it's not possible. You have 304,805 letters. If a person made a mistake and he has to go all the way back to the mistake and fix it in the right order, it will take him 70 years to write Sefer Torah. So Hashem, no, it's not realistic. But when it comes to, to, to tefillin and mezuzot, if a person made a mistake, he has to clean all the letters all the way back to where the mistake is, take a razor, shave the letters from the cloth, fix the mistake, and then continue. Why? It has to be kesidram, in the right order. But if the name of Hashem is there, there's no way to fix it. You have to bury it in the ground, you walk for three hours, too bad, you lost your time, you lost your money. You're not allowed to fix it. If you erase the name of Hashem, it's a very, very, very big sin. Very big sin. However, Hashem say, in order to help the peace between husband and wife, I'm allowing you to erase my name. In the old days, in the time of Beta Mikdash, when, God forbid, a woman did something that wasn't 100% kosher, such as going into a room with a stranger, with another man, and her husband doesn't feel comfortable about it, so if he suspected that she did something worse than that, he takes her to the Kohen and Bet HaMikdash, and they write the name of Hashem, 72 letters on a cloth like a mezuzah, he put it in the water, all the ink goes in the water, the name of Hashem gets erased, and she has to drink it. And if she did something wrong, something horrible happened. And if she didn't, not only nothing happened, she gets a special blessing from the Kohen that all her children will be holy and righteous. And Talmidei Chachamim. So what do we see? That a peace between husband and wife, it's so important that Hashem allow us to make one of the worst sins in the Torah to make peace. And there are many, many other examples. Even when the nation of Israel go and they have to pass through a nation. And these nations are uh, Gentiles, Goim, that are not the best. They hate Israel. They're not so good. Before we go into a war with them, the halacha is, korim laim le shalom. You have to offer them peace, even though they don't deserve peace. But you call them, you tell them, you want to you wanna make peace? All we want is to go through. If they let you, let you go, you don't touch them. And there's many other examples, that's not the topic here tonight, 
of how important is the peace. So when you come to a place, you see everyone lives in peace, everyone is nice together, beautiful. So that's a very, very good thing. But it's not like this all over the world. In other parts of the world, unfortunately, I wish I didn't have to say it, it's not, it's not such brotherhood and, and there's a lot of things that should not take place there. However, let's focus on the negative. To give compliments, okay, it's beautiful, but we need to improve what's wrong, not what's good. What's good we already have, Baruch Hashem. We have to focus on what we're doing wrong in order for us to stop what we're doing wrong. So let me give you a little bit idea what's happening today in the Jewish world. In the United States, 71% of the secular Jews married non-Jews. In New York alone, every day, more than 30 Jews getting married to non-Jews every day. This is what they know. This probably could be a lot worse. But this is just the reality in New York. The Jewish nation started in the same generation like the Chinese nation 4,200 years ago. After the big flood, there were only eight people left in the world. That was 4,200 years ago. Noah and his three sons and the four wives went into the big ark the size of a soccer field one and a half time. That's how big the boat was. And very wide, like this big hole, wide. And like 30 meter wide and 15 meter height. And it's a very big boat. And Noah prepared that, ba that boat for 120 years because it wasn't on depot. You know, you go, you buy everything ready, uh, you know, one, two, three. You bring a few amigos to help you, and right away you finish in uh, less than a month. It was a different world. He had to build it on his own and to put tar to make sure there's no leaks. After he finished, the ark saved him and his family. The world restarted. The archaeologists found the ark of Noah in Turkey, where in a very high mountain. It's called Mountain of Ararat. Today, Ariel showed me this area called Ararat over here. I said to him, it comes from the Torah. The Goim called places based on the Torah. But the, uh, the Noah's Ark was found next to Turkey in a very high mountain. What a boat size of 150 meter has to do in a very high mountain. Boats never come to mountain. When they build a boat like this, they build it on the beach and as soon as it's finished, they give it a push right into the water. Because you cannot bring it with a truck. How are you going to drive such a thing? It takes the whole block. You cannot make a turn. You must build it by the water. They found this ark in a place that nobody in history would be so dumb to bring a boat like this to a mountain. What exactly is going to do with that? For people who are clever, it's enough to know that the story that it's written in the Torah, it's exactly as the Torah says. Why? When the water started to get dry, more and more and more, the boat was floating above the water. When the boat is keep going down, 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 if the boat was on top of that mountain at that moment, it got stuck on the land, and that's it. It cannot move anymore. And that's where it stayed. How Noah is going to move it after the water dry? There's no way to, to do anything. And from there, everything started. Now I know you have to know one thing. The Zohar, the Kabbalah, explaining that until the Ark, the world was one continent, not seven, one. After the Ark, it broke to seven. The scientist, Wagner, German scientist, he died 1920. He lived 50 years, from 1870 to 1920. He won a big prize. His, his discovery is one of the top 10 discoveries in the entire century. What did he find? That the world was one continent and it broke into seven. And he found in each place where it broke from what place? Like a puzzle. Green with green, brown with brown. What happened in the end? He proved exactly what the Zohar say 1900 years before him. But they don't learn about the Zohar in college. So nobody gave a prize to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. 
But he got the prize, no problem, as long as he proved what the Torah said. So let's move on. We started in the same generation like the Chinese. How many Chinese you have in the world? Almost two billion. And the Chinese have restriction on birth, only one kid per family, because they have too many people, they can feed them. The Jews never had any restriction on birth. And the Jews started in the same generation like the Chinese. How do we know? The Torah says, Vayoled et asini. Shem, our father, someone that hates Jews, his name is anti-Semite, anti-Shemi. Why? Because he hates the descendants of Shem. Shem are the Jews. Shem was the uncle of the Chinese. So we, the Chinese, were in the same generation. How they got to close to 2 billion and we are only 13.2 million Jews? The answer is silent holocaust. What does it mean, silent holocaust? If you speak about holocaust, everybody understand. You're speaking about the holocaust who took place 65 years ago. Germany, Poland, the rest of Europe the horrible, famous Holocaust. Everybody knows it. I don't think there's one person in the world who doesn't know about it. But when you speak about the silent Holocaust, almost nobody knows what you're referring to. Nobody knows what you're talking about. The silent Holocaust killed more Jews than what the Germans did. The Germans murdered approximately six million Jews. But the silent Holocaust killed more than two billion Jews. Why? If the Chinese got to 2 billion, we should have been at least 2 billion, no? Because they have restriction on birth, we don't have. Why we are only 13.2 million? The answer is one of the answers. It's not the only answer, there's few other answers, few other reasons, I should say. The answer is intermarriage. The Torah said to the Jews, I'm choosing you today to be my children. I'm giving you my Torah in a public event in front of millions of witnesses, as you can all see. I just took you out of Egypt seven weeks ago. I destroyed the biggest empire in the world, Egypt, for you. I already did a lot for you. But it's nothing compared to what I'm about to do. I'm about to give you right now the Torah. This is all my secrets. This is the book of my instructions. I'm going to teach you right now how I created the world. I'm going to explain to you how you're going to get a ticket for the life of eternity full of the highest spiritual pleasure you can even imagine. You have few conditions. If you follow the conditions, then you will make it there and nobody in the history will be luckier than you. And this is what I'm teaching you today. You're going to become the light for the goyim, or la goyim the light for civilization. No nation contributed to the world, nothing compared to what the Jewish nation contributed to the world. Muhammad, when he brought the Quran, he said that in the Quran he calls us Am Asefer, the nation of the book. He gave us that title, Am Asefer. There's nobody in history who won more prize Nobel winners than Jews statistically. Nobody contributed more to science, to philosophy, to culture, to many other fields like the Jewish nation did. Even though it's such a small nation percentage-wise from the world, we're not even a quarter of a percent from the world, we contributed to the world more than the 99.75% of the rest of the world combined. And obviously it's not something that can, can be done by coincidence, if you know a little bit history. But that's not what we came to talk here about. We want to understand one thing. After the silent holocaust, the Torah told the Jews, to the Jews, you don't have permission to marry anybody from any other nation. Not because they're bad. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. It's not, it doesn't matter. Even the most righteous Gentile in a history, somebody like Eov, Eov is a prophet, is in the Tanakh, is not a, is not a Jew, it's a guy, Eov. If Eov wanted to come marry the worst Jewish woman in a history, 
Someone that Akadosh Baruch Hu cannot even look at her because she's very, very wicked. Not modest, not keeping mitzvot, dirty mouth, making a lot of people miserable. Horrible person. He of compared to her, it's like comparing a diamond to a piece of garbage. He of compared to her, she doesn't have permission to marry he of. Nothing to do with racism. Nothing to do with who is better, who is not better. Nothing to do with money, nothing to do with education, nothing to do with what people think. It's just that Hashem told the Jewish nation, I want my gift to stay among my children and not be spread to the rest of the world. That's why I make you a club, a special VIP. You don't have permission to bring other in unless if they come, and convert to Judaism because they recognize it as the truth of God. Not because they fell in love with Itzik and Avi and Moshe and Miriam and Sarah. No, that's not a valid one. Because they recognize the Torah of the Jews is the only truth and they recognize that the Jews received the Torah in front of millions of witnesses and they love the laws of the Torah and they want to be a part of this nation, and they're willing to sacrifice a lot by giving up their life and culture and family and join the Jewish nation, then they're not only welcome, they're more than welcome, and they reach the highest level in Judaism, the highest level. The Torah said 36 times to love the converts, to help them, never to cheat them, never to deceive them, never to offend them, to have mercy on them, to help them in any possible way. Obviously, Hashem loved the converts. There's no question about it here. But only the real one, not someone who wanted to be a basketball player in Maccabi Tel Aviv, so they, he couldn't bring, they couldn't bring him because he's not a citizen. So I said, okay, no problem, Mr. Johnson. Tomorrow I'll talk to my friend in the Israeli government. We'll make you a special certificate. You're going to be Mr. Elisha Ben Avraham. Elisha ben Avraham, but he still eat pork on Yom Kippur. How he became Elisha ben Avraham? He's, he knows how to, sh to shoot a ball into the basket. So they made him, Baruch Hashem, a rabbi. Now he's the new rabbi. It's true stories. It happens all the time. That's not a convert. The real ones that come to keep Shabbat, come to eat kosher, come to learn Torah, come to be a part of the Jewish nation, like I say, they're more than welcome and reach the highest level. So one problem, silent holocaust. Second problem, divorce. There is a major, major epidemic in the world in general, especially in the Jewish world, what we call divorce. Many, many families are broken into pieces and get destroyed. The divorce rate in Israel in major cities goes more than 70%. Same thing in New York. More than 70%. There are cities in the world the divorce rate is more than 100%. How can it be? How can it be? If you have a million, a million couple here, how can it be 1.2 million divorces if there's only 1 million families? The answer is this man or this woman already divorced five, six times. They bring up the statistic, unfortunately. They are, believe it or not, some places that it's not a question to ask if you divorce or not. It's how many times you divorce. Only one? Oh, lucky you. They make a joke about it. You go today to a class, and I don't know about Mexico, that's why I don't want to talk about here. You know better than me. But I'm talking Europe, I'm talking Israel, I'm talking United States mainly, that's where I live for 24 years already. If you come to a class, a secular public school, and you ask who comes from a divorce house, almost all the kids raise their hand. Almost all of them. And that shows you the danger. Now, you may think, okay, listen, secular people, they have a lot of temptation. They watch movies, they go to beaches, they go, they go to all kinds of places. It's very hard to be loyal and faithful. So that's why it happens in their culture. But by religious people, they're not supposed to happen. So therefore, the divorce rate by religious people should be 2%, 3%. Sometimes there's sicknesses, sometimes there's other reasons. 
But the problem is that it's not the case. It's also growing a lot. Among the religious people, the divorce rates are going higher and higher every month. Every month there's more divorce cases. Some people want to explain it because Baruch Hashem, many, many Jews becoming religious. They become Baalei Tshuva, what we call. Even here, Baruch Hashem, there's a lot of awakening. People waking up to become closer and closer to Hashem and to Torah. Just because a person a month ago was not uh, religious and now he became religious, he's still far away from being perfect. Therefore, he still may have bad personality. He still have anger. He's still not generous. He still criticizes his wife all the time. He does all kinds of things. Very difficult to be married to him. Just because he has nice yamaka and grew a little beard and he comes to shul now to pray, he has a long way until he fixes his entire problem. So therefore, so many Baalei Tshuva joined the religious world, but they don't, they did not correct their personality yet. It's the major thing in life. This is what the Torah taught us. Tikkun Amidot, Ze Kola Adam. That's the purpose of life, to take the Torah that Hashem gave us. If you came to the world stingy, you must leave the world generous. You came to the world angry, you must leave the world, calm down the lowest level. You came to the world full of pride and ego, you have to leave the world down to earth, you feel that you dust in the wind, nothing, nothing more than that. You came to the world full of criticism, you like to put people down, you like to always focus on the negative, you like to speak Lashon Hara, all kinds of things like this, you must Leave the world that your mouth is sealed and you only look at the positive and you're not criticizing and you're focusing on your problem. There's many things to correct. Just because you became religious, Shomer Shabbat, and started to eat kosher, it doesn't mean you became a better human being. That's why the Baalei Tshuva raised the statistic, unfortunately, in a religious world and now there are much more divorce cases. It, there is some truth into this explanation, but as someone who works with complete secular people and with complete religious communities, I do both, I'm telling you that the truth is much, much bigger than that. If that was the only reason, at least we have a logical explanation. The truth is different. Among the very, very religious people in the world, ultra, ultra Hasidic, ultra, ultra Orthodox, the marriage situation is very bad. It's not as good as it used to be 30 years ago. It's going worse and worse and worse every year. So it's a horrible situation. So that's the second major problem. If this problem will not be fixed, this is a serious jeopardy to the future of the Jewish nation. Not the Jewish individuals. As a nation, God forbid, we can be destroyed completely. Why? If every house will be broken, what future the nation has? Why? When the house break, if they lucky, the children stay normal. They go between the father and mother, and in peace and harmony, they share their time. But most of the time, it's not the case. They stay with one of the parents, and a very horrible, bitter, cruel war begins. The kids become like a ba basketball, throw it from one side to the other. Parents use their children to get what they want, and they destroy their life. Later, these kids cannot learn, cannot work, cannot get married, cannot function. They need psychological help on a daily basis, and sometimes psych psychiatric help. Why? Because they are a product of a horrible family situation where they come from. They saw violence, they saw problems, they saw bad mouth, they saw all kinds of wars, horrible things. Horrible things. And that's a serious jeopardy, not only to the Jewish nation, to the entire world. You know, I remember when I was a kid, when I was a kid, most of the people in Israel were not religious. Still, not like today, but there were a lot more traditional people in those days. But still, most of the people were not Shomer Shabbat. 
But the divorce rate 40 years ago was close to zero among the secular Jews. Nothing to talk about the religious. By the religious, nobody heard about divorce. My rabbi once told me that when he was a kid, and he's about 68 years old now, when he was a kid, he walked on the street with his father, hand to hand, little kid. And he asked his father, Abba, Gerushin, what is a divorce? And his father gave him such a smack because though this word was such a dirty word, no one dared to even say it on their mouth, even among the secular people 60 years ago when he was a kid. Today, 60 years later, it's a way of life. One to three, one year marriage, divorce. Three months marriage, divorce. There's a case where I live, not far. The father made a wedding to his son and he paid one million dollars for the wedding. He bought a very big tent with air conditions, lots of workers, made a special floor. He actually built a catering hall because he had like more than a thousand people and he wanted to do it where he wanted to do it. So, you know, he had to build the, the, the tent. Three days after the marriage, they got divorced. Three days. Three days she left the house, she left the boy, and all the money got burned. So this is just to show you what a risk we live in. What are the other problems? The drugs epidemic. And again, I don't know what's going on here, so maybe some of the things I said doesn't apply to Mexico. Like for instance, I was in Belgium, I spoke about this topic, some of the things I say there, they told me after, over here, Baruch Hashem, that thing we don't have at all. Or this one we don't have. So every place is a little different. I'm talking overall, in the world. It doesn't have to be specific to one city. The drug epidemic, it's a disaster. Almost every secular kid in America and in Israel is using drug on a weekly basis. Almost everybody from 100 kids, more than 90 are doing it. Now you may think again, oh, that's people with no culture, with no Torah, with no religion. They did not go to yeshiva. So, okay, what are you surprised? All day they watch Hollywood movie, they watch these things on television, so they get curious, they want to try. But that's not the case. Of course, by the secular people, the percentage are much, much higher. But you have religious kids, son of big rabbis. The father is holy and righteous, and the mother, and they have another six, seven brothers in yeshivot, and one injecting heroin to his vein every day. And not one case, in my eyes, I saw more than 10 cases just in the last, mo in the last month and a half. It's a horrible situation. He has a yarmulke on his head and he does things like this. Who heard such a thing? I'm not talking other drugs, which is every, uh, every hour or two, you know, smoking and things like this. Now, what happens when people use drugs on a constant basis? These people, one, they will have to be the judges, the head of the police, the head of the government. These people will decide who's going to live and who's going to die. Who will spend his life in jail? And if we go to a war against Iran or not? Right now, we have in the government few people that are very not religious. Some of them even hate religion, but at least they're intelligent. At least they have a brain. At least they understand army. They understand politics. They understand the economy, at least. They have some advisors. What's going to be in 20 years from now? Who is going to be the next, the next president or the next prime minister? If 90 out of 100 kids are in heavy drugs, and one of them one day will have to be the president. You know, who, so can you rely on a person like this to decide for five, six million people if they're going to live and going to die? Where, what is the future showing? It's very, very dangerous. I just came from Toronto, and uh, I don't know if you listen to the news, but the mayor of Toronto is all over the news admitting that he used heavy drugs. I don't know exactly what drugs he used, but supposedly the worst ones. So, <laughs> believe it or not, when I was there, the person who organized the lecture told me a few days before the lecture, I confirmed with the mayor's office that he's coming to your lecture. 
<laughs> I didn't know how bad is the news yet. I heard this. He admitted for using drugs. But even Obama admitted. Even some uh, people in the Israeli government, it's not the end of the world anymore. But when I arrived to Toronto, they told me, you don't understand what's happening here. So I started to pray to Hashem. I said, well, I don't want controversy over here. But the person who hosted me in Canada told me, believe it or not, even though with all this comedy, is going to get elected again. Because there's no other alternative. It's not that you have gold and mud, so you choose the gold. What do you have? You have a piece of stone and a piece of glass. So this is not good. This is better. This is what's happening. This is a place that is blessed. The economy over there never got down, like in America. And people live in a high lifestyle. And you know, it's, a, it's one of the better countries in the world, Canada. And still, this is the face of the generation. There are many more other problems, but let's focus on what the Gemara told us about what's going to happen in our days 2,000 years ago. Now, I want to remind you, in case you forgot, that when this Gemara was written, when the Gemara wanted to speak about a prostitute woman, they describe a woman who picked up her dress to her knee. Not more than the knee. And already, everyone in Israel knew nobody will ever marry her. This is the generation that those things that I'm about to read to you was written. If a woman dare to pick up her skirt on the street, up to the knee, not completely, up to the knee, that's it. So, ah, she's not modest. Stay away from her. Who knows how many problems you're going to have. This is the generation I'm talking about. In the generation I spoke about, we still had prophets. We had Knesset Agdola, 120 chief rabbis. Everyone was extremely holy. People who knew all the Torah by heart. In a generation I spoke, I'm speaking about, nobody smoked, no cigarettes, no drugs. Nobody did the things that we did today. And the entire nation of Israel, you couldn't find one Mechalel Shabbat in 70 years. The Jewish court executed one person once in 70 years. And the nation called them cruel court. Cool. Why? Every 70 years they executed one person. So the situation was much, much, much better than today. Nobody would ever believe that we will get to the days that we live in. But this is like a 100% prophecy. This is what the Gemara say. First, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the writer of the Zohar, the Kabbalah. He said, Oilim Omar, Oilim Lo Omar. Or oh, if I'm going to say, or oh, if I'm not going to say. One way or the other, it's like catch-22. The generations before the Mashiach would come, what we call Acharit Ayamim, the end of days, which is in our days, we are in the last quarter from 24 quarters of the creation. When Hashem made the world, He told us the world will be maximum 6,000 years. We are in 5,773. Four. Already four. Soon it's going to be five. Rosh Hashanah coming in a few months. So we are now 24 years into the last quarter. Let me explain. If you take 6,000 and divide it by 24, it gives you 24 parts of 250 years. Right? 23 times 250, it gives 5,750. So 23 parts are over. The last part is also 250 years. 24 years passed, because we are in 74, right? So 24 years passed. How many years it gives us? 226 years maximum to the end of this world. No. Don't worry, you don't have to wait that long. Most likely, it will happen in our days. Why? Chazal, that had Ruach HaKodesh and a prophecy, they say, Ba'elef HaShishi, Ve'lo Besofo Yavu HaGoel. 
there's all kinds of calculations based on the psukim, most likely at least 200 years before the end. So how many years it gives us? 26. Judging the audience over here, I don't see people that are too old. So most of you, Bezrat Hashem, or all of us, will be alive to see those days. The question is, do we want to see those days? We'll explain soon. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said like this, every generation had a weakness. One generation had a strong desire for idol worshipping. One generation had strong desire for stealing. One generation had sinat chinam, what we call politics. Everyone against everyone, disrespect. Every generation, according to the history of the Jewish nation, there was one main sin, one, that the people used to do frequently. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, before the Mashiach would come, Hashem will take all the dirty souls. Dirty in a spiritual way, not physical, because the soul is a spiritual energy. It's dirty from the sins. Souls that reincarnated already a few times in the world. They were in a time of idol worshipping, they were in a time of sinat chinam. They came already to the world a few times. And the fact that they have to be reincarnated again in our time shows, according to the Torah, that they did not correct themselves yet. These people did not clean the dirt. So before the end of days, Hashem will take all the dirty souls from all the generations and will give them one last final chance to get saved. To get saved from what? From spiritual, eternal death. Spiritual, eternal death. I want to tell you a quick story. 15 years ago, one day I was sitting in a yeshiva learning Gemara with my chevruta, and I got a call. What was the call? I was waiting for this call for three days. The call arrived, someone from Brooklyn, my friend. Those days, maybe by now I, I, I said 15 years, maybe it was 17 years. We're getting old faster. So about 17 years ago, he told me, now it's your opportunity. Get in your car and come quickly to Brooklyn. Now I live at least an hour and a half ride from Monsey to Brooklyn, minimum, if there's no traffic. Get in a car and come right away. I say why? This was the generation, the days, that the world discovered that autistic kids are not what we thought. We thought they brain damage, they don't understand anything from their life. Poor kids, everyone has a pity on them, and that's what everyone thought. All of a sudden, in one year, in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, England, three different countries, they decided to put computers in schools of autistic and Down syndrome children. Same year, three different countries. They brought computer, so the autistic kids can play with the computer. Okay. Until that day, the mentor, the teachers, they try to teach the autistic kids to say one sentence. The woman from New Zealand or from Australia, she tried to teach these little autistic kids to say, I love you. One week, two weeks, two months, one year. Very difficult. They cannot put together work. The brain is not working normally. So they had huge frustration of achieving anything with these kids. All of a sudden, first day they brought computer to the school, the autistic kids started to punch sentences, one after the other. They can talk, but all of a sudden, they shocked the world. The world was in shock in three different countries. They found that autistic kids are much, much more intelligent than what we used to think. Today, after 20 years, 
Today they not only know that they are intelligent, they know for sure that this is very special souls that have even higher abilities than normal people like us. Today it's, it's a well-known thing already. I'm coming now from a religion, from Jewish religion point of view. The Torah says that when Hashem sent the soul back to the world in a new body, what we call reincarnation, which by the way was proven scientifically, I brought you many, many CDs. You have some CDs there on the table and outside, all free of charge, courtesy of good people who donate. And one of the CDs is a DVD I made. It's a very, very successful, popular CD. They already translated to different languages. It's called Life After Death. Over there, I show one million percent, not 100 percent, one million percent proofs that life will begin in a time of death. What we have right now, it's a preparation for the real life. And not only that, I prove over there, according to science, and then, of course, according to the Torah, that all of us were here in different bodies, in different countries, with different languages, in different generations. How can it be proven? Very simple. You take a person and you hypnotize him. You make him fall asleep like this, partially. And then you begin to speak to his subconscious. What we call in Judaism, the soul, the neshama. And then you begin to regress him. Regression, regressia. And you take him back in time, something amazing. This is a 100% scientific proof. Many, many times was performed. You tell him, okay, now you are 30 years old. So let's see, he was born in 1984. So you tell them, let's go to 1988. He was four years old. Tell me where you are. Two o'clock, August, August 12, two o'clock in the afternoon. Tell me where you are. He was four years old. All of a sudden, you see a 30 years old guy or girl begin to talk in the voice of a kid four years old with the exact voice of a little kid. And then you say to him, okay, let's go back to 1970. How can you go back to 1970 if he was born in 1984? That's 14 years before he was born. Sometimes you get silence. No answer, it's like this. You talk to him, like talking to the wall. So you say, okay, let's go back to 1960. All of a sudden he wake up. It's very scary to see it, you get shocked. And he begins to talk, different voice, Different language, different everything. All of a sudden, the same person that was talking now in a regular voice, and then like a four years old kid in English, all of a sudden begin to speak Persian. Where are you? I live in Tehran. What's your name? Yosef Levy. But right now his name is Itzhak Cohen. So what's your name? Yosef Levy. Begins to speak Parsi. Where do you live? Tehran. How old are you? Because it's in a different body now. 65 years old. Where, where are you? 1960, August uh, 15, 1960. Two o'clock. I sell rugs right now. And you begin to talk like he's selling the rug to a customer 50 something years ago. And then you can go regression, regression, regression. You need a lot of patience. And one woman, they regressed her in nine different bodies. All the way to 1100, in the time when the people of York in England used to burn synagogues and kill the Jews in York. This woman described, after they took her in nine different bodies, that she hide with her children in a basement of the church, and she named the name of the church in York. And the people who did the regression went to York, to that church that is still exists until today. 900 years old church. And they went to the place and they asked the pastor over there, where is the entrance to the, exit, to the basement? He said, there's no basement in this church. They said to him, impossible. It has to be a basement. So I'm telling you, I'm here already 10, 20, whatever it is. No, nobody ever told me there's a basement here. They started to check. 
then they found that is a hidden, hidden entrance. They moved something, they picked it up, there was stairs going downstairs. They went downstairs, they found the exact place where this woman described when she hid with her children when they were coming to kill the Jews. 900 years ago, they found, without that regression, they would never know the church has a basement. Nobody ever knew. This is just one, one out of many examples, which I show in my film over there, very interesting film. So we know for sure now that their souls went from one body to another. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, before the end of time, Hashem will give one last chance to all the people from all the generation to come to this world. But the test will be the hardest it's ever been. In every generation, you had to deal with one problem. Sinat Chinam. That's the problem. Shabbat, everyone kept. Modesty, a woman would dare to walk the way women dress today on the street? Of course not. Learning Torah, everyone learned. Doing business honestly, most people did. What was the problem? Sinat Chinam. Or... Attraction to the idols. How Jews who heard the voice of God wants to worship idols? The answer is God gave power to the idols to balance the free choice. The Torah said, do not worship idols. Don't go and ask questions from the idols. Don't ask the idols to make you cure. But that means it's possible. Then we have many examples like this in the Tanakh. So now we have the final opportunity, it's very difficult, but at the same time Hashem gave us tools that if we'll be clever and smart, within a year or two we can make all the Jews come back to Torah. Why? One day I, one day I decided to open a website. It wasn't actually my decision, it's two of my ballet tshuva opened it for me. Until that day, I used to go give a lecture, 50 people, I was very happy. Wow, spoke to 50 non-religious Jews today. Tomorrow, another one, 40. If you get lucky, 100 come. Once in a while, you have a big seminar, 500 people come. The end of the month, how many people you see? 3,000, if you're lucky. Wow, 3,000 Jews I spoke to. Wow, amazing. Walk like a dog. Today, there's not one hour, whether I'm awake, whether I'm asleep, that I don't have more than 10,000 listeners without doing nothing. Not in person, just on the internet. Not to talk about Facebook, not to talk about hundreds of channels of YouTube that I don't even know about, or different websites. Just in my own website. Thousands of thousands of views every day. So Hashem gave us a tool to reach people that I will never see them in a million years. If I wanted to see the amount of people I saw last year, it will take me one million years to reach them, physically. So Hashem gave us something, CDs, one dollar CD, 30 hours of Torah. You give a Jew two, three dollars as a gift, 50% chance he becomes Shomer Shabbat. It's a game of number. When in a history we had an opportunity like this? Never. If Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to speak to the whole nation, he had to gather all of them to one place, but he didn't have a microphone. <laughs> How he can talk? It's, he has to scream, and it goes from mouth to mouth. It was a big, a big challenge. In the time of Ben Ishchai, they used to have flags in the shul. There's so many people, nobody knew when they, to say amen on a Kaddish. So there was one person standing on a bima, just before they have to say amen, he raised the flag. Why? It was no microphone, it was big. It wasn't like today, they build everything acoustic and all that. So it was a different generation. But at the same time, the same tools that can save so many souls can destroy them the same speed. If you want to put something of kfira, also a million people watch it in a month. The question is, are we going to use it correctly or not? That's our free choice. Now let me read to you the words of the Gemara. Be'acharit ayamim, in the end of days, there will be few things in the world. One, pnei ador ke pnei akelev. The face of the generation would be like the face of a dog. 
people that's supposed to be divine people will behave like dogs or worse than dogs. Ten years ago, AT&T was a, a major telephone, telecommunication company in New York, in, in America, AT&T. They made a catalog, advertisement. People that look like their dogs. People send pictures of themselves and their dogs. And the people were proud that they are twins with their dogs. So they show one guy has a beard. He made like a, you know, like a line like this. He sees his dog has the same thing. A woman with curly hair, the dog has the same exact curly hair. All kinds of things. And you look at the face of the dog, you look at the face of the owner, and you say to yourself, oh, what an amazing thing. Mamash twins. We laugh now. But the people who sent that picture to AT&T and they got elected, they were proud that they look like their dogs. You laughing? I'm going to shock you now, in case you don't know it. Do you, do you know that thousands of people marry their dogs every year in the world in a real wedding with a wedding gown? Did you know that or no? Go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and put women marry their dog in official wedding and see how many cases like this you see. They show the woman and her dog is right there and they say, Areat Mekudeshet Li. She's married the dog. This is her husband. She showed the world. She makes a party. She makes a video. It's putting it on YouTube. She's proud. She says, the most loyal friend I had. I'm in love with him. Not one or two or five. Thousands. Thousands. When the Torah said, 3,300 years ago, do not have relationship with animals. People used to think, why Hashem is wasting his time writing it in the Torah? <laughs> Who wants to marry his donkey? <laughs> Who wants to marry his sheep? Today, millions of people marry to their animals in the world. Millions. That's the Gemara say, this was written in a generation of holy prophets. What did it say? Before Mashiach come, Pnei Ador will be like the face of the dog. Okay, that's one sign. Achutzpah tisge. People will have chutzpah. How do you say chutzpah in Spanish? Descarado? Perquenza? In English, there's no word for it. No, there's really no word for it. So the Americans started to use the Hebrew word chutzpah, but they don't know how to say chu. So they say chutzpah. Okay. Chutzpah means arrogance. That's really the right word in English. Arrogance. That people are arrogant. What caused people to be arrogant, to have chutzpah? No patience. Pride. They think they're the best. <coughs> Everyone is garbage and I am the diamond. And everyone owe me. Everyone is in the world to serve me. That's why when he gets married, he sits on the couch and he's dying to drink tea in a cold winter night, but he doesn't make himself a cup of tea. Why? He waits two hours until his wife comes home. Soon as she walks home, Sarah, can you make me tea? Two hours he sits on the couch. He doesn't want to get up to the sink to put some water in the pot. Why? Everyone here is to serve me. Oh, you already see the wedding of the dogs? Yes. Usually I don't lie. Not usually. I never lie in a lecture. Mistakes, I'm a person. I can make mistakes. Even though I'm very careful not to make mistakes also. But to know that what I say is not true, I don't remember it happened to me even once. If I have a doubt about something, I'd rather not to say if I read it in a place that's supposed to be official, then I, I say it. If they made a mistake, go and blame them. But let's move on. Yeah, yeah, no, here you go. <laughs> well, uh, maybe you should keep it until uh, you should, we show it on the screen, maybe. Anyway, the next uh, example. Now, the next one, the next sign, 
היוקר יאמיר. Everything will become expensive. Price is going higher and higher and higher and higher. A little lousy one bedroom apartment in Yerushalayim is already $800,000. One bedroom from a building that is 70 or 80 years old. No elevator. You have to walk with all the bags three floors up. $800,000. Seven, eight years ago was 200,000. Now 800,000. Everything become expensive, but everything else, the salary stay the same. When I came to America, people in America in 1989 made $7 per hour. Gas was less than a dollar a gallon, 25 cents per liter. Today it's four dollars a gallon, four times or five times more. Health insurance cost me three hundred dollars a month. Now it's fifteen hundred dollars a month. Rent was seven hundred dollars for the apartment. Today it's two thousand dollars and up in the worst areas. So everything became three or four or five times more. And people still make seven dollars an hour. It's a fact. People that work in a dirty job Seven dollars an hour. That's what they made in 1989. That's what they make today. Seven dollars an hour. So that means everything become expensive. And I understand also the real estate here is starting to go higher and higher. In Israel, an average worker can only dream to own one day an apartment. It's not going to happen. That's it. Unless if you win the lottery. You will have to work 70 years to buy an apartment. Right? He makes a thousand dollars a month. And his cost of living is 2000 a month. So how is he going to save to buy a million dollar apartment or half a million dollars? How? If his parents won't buy it to him, if they have money, he can only dream. And the rent? The rent. Used to be $400 a month. Now it's $1,400 a month in Yerushalayim. Same apartments. And the salaries in Israel, still $1,000 for an average worker per month. 4,000 shekel. That's what an Israeli makes. You understand? One more problem. The daughter-in-laws will stop respecting their mother-in-laws like it used to be, which means 30, 40 years ago, there was really no difference between your mother and the mother of your husband. No difference. I remember... When I was a kid, the wives respected the mother of the, their husband, sometimes even more than their own mother. And not only that, they used to call them Ima. I remember my mother used to call my grandmother from my father's side Ima. She didn't call her by her name. Not only that, many of them made them live with them in a house for years. As a matter of fact, there is two communities that are very blessed financially among the Jews. By the Sfaradim. Who are they? The most advanced. Syrians and Persians. They are the wealthiest in the world. They made an article in New York Times or one of the major newspapers in, in, in America that the Persian immigrants, the Jews, were the most successful immigrants in the history of the United States. As far as numbers of immigrants compared to how many billions they gain. And the Syrians are just as high in New York, or maybe even more. So what's the secret that those two communities are so blessed? Do you think it's coincidence? One of the major reasons is that they respect their parents very, very much, and they don't throw them to old age home to die there alone. They bring him into the house, and all the family comes, and the mother or the father of the family stay the king until the last breath he take. In other communities, some do, some don't. Some already count when already we're going to find them a place that we can put them there, that we can come once a year to see if they're still alive. One, per, one person in Israel, he had one million dollar life saving. Israeli men. His wife passed away and he stayed alone. 
So he said, I'm not going to be like all these foolish, wealthy guys that wait until they die that their children will enjoy their money. I want to see how my children enjoy my money in my lifetime. So he called his three sons. He had three sons. I want to give you all my savings now. That I'm only 70 years old. Let me leave you ears and see how you're enjoying my money. Thank you, Abba. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. No problem. So each one of them took a third of the million. The first two months, out of gratitude, until that day, they used to host the father for Shabbat, because he's alone. One time by him, one time by him, one time by him. Like a, like a circle. All of a sudden, about two months after he gave them the money, they begin to fight. Now, not who's going to have him. You take him. No, my, my wife is sick. No, I, I'm going away. I'm coming back from a trip on Friday. I'm not going to have time to pick him up. They begin to fight. So in the beginning, they feel bad to leave him alone on Shabbat. After a few more weeks, forgot about him completely. And they don't invite him at all. He stays alone. So he comes to the rabbi. He says, Rabbi, look what a mistake I made. I thought I'm doing something good, but my children forgot about me. Ishlichuni le'ed zikna. The pasuk say, Al tashlicheni le'ed zikna. And they forgot about me. So the rabbi say, you made a big mistake. It's true, because the Torah say not to do what you did. But don't worry. I'm going to fix your mistake. <laughs> the rabbi... <laughs> The rabbi told him, tomorrow morning you call your oldest son, tell him, come with your car, and let's go to the locksmith. We have to buy a safe. So your son will ask you, Abba, what do you need a safe for? So you tell him, there's few rubies and diamonds that I still have from my old days that I still did not give to you. This is the major inheritance. And I don't feel safe that it's hidden in the apartment, I want to have safe. That's all. And everything from this moment on, your life will go back to the way it was. Okay, Rabbi. Call up his son. Can you bring a big tender to come take the safe? Abba, what do you need a safe for? I have some diamonds, rubies. It's not safe here. The neighbors became, you know, dangerous. No problem. Tomorrow, 9 o'clock, I'll come. Not only he came, all three showed up. Abba, we need three because the safe is very heavy and we have to install it to bring it up. So a whole day work. So they went, they put a big safe, they bring it up, they have to find the right beam because, you know, in America it's all sheet rack. You punch the wall, your hand goes to the neighbor's apartment. So you need to find where to put it. Otherwise the whole building can collapse. If it begins to fall down, boom, 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 it's like it will go all the way to the top, to the bottom floor. So they have to find the right place. After they sweat in the humidity of Israel all day like this in Bnei Brak, they finally installed the safe. That's it. From that Shabbat, they begin to fight against who's going to have their father. Seven years he lived. One day he passed away. The lawyer called them up. Come, your father left his key for the safe. And he said that we have to open the safe when I'm present and take the, the, the whatever he left over there and divided it equally between all three of you. So they're all very excited. Who know what kind of rupees? <laughs> so they come to the safe, they open it up. They see one pile of sand and a little paper stuck in it. They take out the paper. Kacha ye'ase lebanim kfuyei tovach. שהשליחו את אביהם לעת זקנה, תאכלו הרבה חול. העיר עם לאפיק דרך עוד. You're not supposed to interpret my love also in love. It's okay. I, I, don't, I don't understand what he said, but I can see he's doing a perfect job. All right. Yeah. Ah. translation? They, they don't understand Hebrew, some people. Ah. So I said, he's trans when he translates, he does a great job. 
So when I laugh, you also laugh. No, 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 no. What, 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 what you said in Hebrew, words, the words in Hebrew, Hebrew translate them in Ah, he did not translate the Hebrew? But I'm not, no, we're, not, we're not using the Hebrew. Ah, wow, 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 wow. I'm getting old, I'm telling you. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Papele, papele. Papele. Okay, so they made a pile of sand. He put a pile of sand inside the safe. And he stuck a piece of paper inside. And they saw it. This is what ungrateful children that threw their father in his old days to the garbage deserve to get. <laughs> sand. Eat a lot of sand. Seven years he lived like a king. Why? Because they were hoping to get the rubies. So, there are a few more problems. What is it? Ben lo itbayesh me'aviv. Boy is not going to be embarrassed from his father anymore. What only, now what does it mean? They sit, the father and the son, and smoke drugs together. Can you believe such thing? This is what's happening today as we speak. Not only that, he has Christina, his girlfriend, Russian from Russia, from Ukraine, with a big cross on her, on her chest. And he come to the house with her, and his father and mother sitting right here on the couch, and he takes Christina to the room and close the door, three steps from his parents, and spend the night with her, and his father has a yamaka on his head. And it happened in thousands of houses in Israel. Every building in Israel almost has a, a one apartment, prostitution home, imported from Russia and Ukraine. Every city in Israel has 150 pork stores all over. Why? The 800,000 Russian goyim that came to Israel love a lot of pork. So now pork became the number one seller meat in Israel. And the Israelis, some of them also don't keep, so they also eat. And that's what's happening. Chutzpah tisge. Agefen tie beshefa. The, the, the grapes will be so many, and the wine will become more and more expensive. The inflation will go higher and higher. All the things that are happening in our time, the Gemara spoke about. And in the end, the conclusion. Since the situation will be so critical, Every one of the Jews in the world will go down on his knees and say, God, we got the point. Have mercy on us. That's why we cannot take it anymore. Religious, not religious, rabbi, everyone would scream, save us. Why? No more pride, no more ego. This is what we say, Bayom Aruye Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The Gaon Mi Vilna lived until 200 years ago in Vilna. He wrote in a generation that there was no machine guns, no bombs, no airplanes, no atomic bombs, no nuclear weapon, no, none of the things we have today. When people went to fight 250 years ago, they had born an arrow, and they had old primitive gun, no bullets. You have to take powder and put inside, like a horn. Put inside and it makes noise. Psh, that's it. So the, that generation, the Gaon Mivil Narot, that the last war when Mashiach come, will take nine minutes and the world will be over. Nine minutes and it will be over. How did the Gaon Mi Vilna wrote something that looked so foolish 200 years ago? It looks very foolish. How a world can be finished in a war with some powder in nine minutes? You need nine million hours to finish the war, not nine minutes. And the Gaon Mi Vilna was the most brilliant person in the world. Today we understand. It's very simple. Few nuclear weapon. Do you, do you know that a week ago, Russia threatened the United States with, by a nuclear war? Clearly. One of the Russian politicians say, spoke about the nuclear thing. And Obama answered, 
better to surrender to the Russian than to have a nuclear war. So they're already speaking about it. Pakistan has bombs. Iran probably have or will have a bomb within months. The problem is, if United States have nuclear bombs, we don't worry so much, because we know they won't throw it just for nothing. When, when a Muslim fanatic country have a bomb, we don't know what to expect. Why? They don't care to die. In the Quran, in the Islam, they have a belief. What's their belief? Their belief is that they have to do it. This is what they believe in. So for them, if they commit suicide because they think that by murdering innocent people they go to heaven, why not doing it to a billion people? So that we don't know what to expect. But one thing we do know. The Gaon Mivilna say one more thing that until a week ago I didn't know. He say the beginning of the salvation would be when the Russian would occupy an island. What's the name of the island? Huh? Crimea. Crimea? Crimea? Crimea. No, no, what's the name of that island that they just occupied? Yeah, Crimea. Crimea? In Spanish Crimea or in English? Maybe in Ukraine. Ukraine. Yeah, the Ukraine island. Crimea. Okay. So the name of the island that they occupied 200 years ago, the Gaon Mivilna say, when Russia will occupy this island, you should know that we are moments before the arrival of Mashiach. But he gave one more sign. You will know that it's very, very close when the Russians' legs would be in Istanbul. In Turkey. I don't know. Maybe they're planning something. But this is things that the Gaon Vilna wrote 200 years ago. Mamash, we see today a prophecy. One way or the other, with or without the Gaon Vilna, we have a prophecy in Zachary 14. Zachariah, the prophet, that described the end of the world. That two thirds of the world will be wiped out in moments. And the other third, Hashem will clean the world from all the people who are half enough. The wicked people will be clean. The righteous people will get saved. And the people half enough, like some of us, will have a trial period. Trial period to save themselves. And after that, let me read to you some of the verses. Some Jews, they over-optimistic. They think just because they have a good heart and they're not damaging anybody and they don't steal and they're polite, they're not bad people, that when Mashiach comes, automatically they get saved. I'm not a bad person. Why should God be upset with me? What am I doing? I'm not stealing. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not insulting. I'm not speaking Lashon Hara. But he doesn't keep Shabbat. He doesn't eat kosher. Or she doesn't dress modest on the street. Or other things that people do. That creates a problem. Why? Let me read to you some of the verses. First, the prophet wrote, Huva letzion goel leshaveh pesha beyaakov. Only to the Jews who made full tshuva and returned from all the crimes against God. To steal, it's a crime. So if you don't steal, you're not a criminal when it comes to money. Very good. But there's other crimes. Just because you're good at four or five things doesn't mean you're good in everything. Many times Jews, religious Jews, can be very good in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then all of a sudden they had two very serious problems. They must fix it. Why? Otherwise they're in a jeopardy. Why? I'm going to read to you some verses. That's speaking about who's going to survive those days. Mi ale be'ar Hashem. Who is going to get saved, like picking up the fish with the net from the water? Who is going, who Hashem will pick up and save to his mountain, to his life of eternity? Who? Neki kapayim uvar levav. Someone that never steal, never take advantage on people. Do not charge interest from another Jew. 
and his heart is clean. What does it mean his heart is clean? He see other Jews successful, he's happy. He see somebody else made money, he's happy. Everything that he sees, his heart is open and clean and he's not jealous and he's not speaking against his competition. So that's one condition to get saved. But it's not it only. There's other conditions. This is what the Prophet say. Sherit Israel. Sherit Israel means the Jews who will survive. What does it teach us? Some will not survive, God forbid. Sherit, the leftover. Sherit Israel. Lo Asu Avla after the Mashiach would come. Those who will survive already will never do avla. Velo yedabru kazav will never lie even once again. No lie will ever come from their mouth. Velo imatze befiem leshon tarmit. And they will never deceive anyone. So we see that one of the conditions to get saved in the time of Mashiach is to be extra, extra honest. You can have a beautiful beard, you keep Shabbat, you do a lot of nice things, and you steal from your customers. Also, you steal from non-Jews, which is even worse than to steal from Jews. Why? Because not only it's a sin from the Torah to steal in general, you're making the non-Jews thinking, how is it possible that this Jew, which is a son of God, the chosen people, behave worse than, uh, than anything that we can imagine? So that's called Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem. It's embarrassing the name of Hashem. So that's why it's not permitted to steal from the government. It's not permitted to steal from insurance company. It's not permitted to steal from Federal Express and from UPS and to tell them the package didn't arrive. All these things that maybe, I don't know, maybe some people who are Shomer Shabbat doing will cause them a huge problem in the end. Why? Because Hashem is clean. And we are the children of Hashem, must be clean. No lies, no lying on the application, no taking money from the government when you drive a Mercedes. No. You have to be what the Torah says. Some religious Jews look at the Jews who drive on Shabbat, and they say, what a pity, poor guy. Halel Shabbat. He's cutting himself out of Judaism, according to the Torah. God forbid, can lose his eternity. So he's thinking what a poor Jew this one is. But in reality, you are a big thief, and you're just as bad as him. You think, oh, I'm a, I'm a very religious guy. What do you mean? You eat kosher, very nice. You keep Shabbat, very nice. But you have big hat, very nice. But what? all your life is a lie. Customers in a business, doing all kinds of things. It's not permitted. Before we finish, it says like this, To'avat Hashem kol avel. People who do despicable things, people who make other people upset, people who make other people cry and be broken heart, all kinds of things that we see all the time today unfortunately happen. It's called To'avat Hashem. To'ava means it's despicable in the eyes of God. It says like this. Va'avadetem et Hashem elokechem. When you serve your God, you follow His laws. What will be the results of it? Uverach et lachmecha. He will bless your food. Ve'et memecha, and everything that you drink will be blessed. machala mikirbecha. Ah, ki ani Hashem rofecha. Because I am God, your doctor. The doctors are very, very important. Without them, sometimes people die, or they stay sick. But with all due respect to the doctors, if Hashem doesn't want this person to leave, the doctor can save him against Hashem? Not possible. And if the doctor will do everything he can, it's up to Hashem final decision. Doctors sometimes give their entire life to try to save a patient, and Hashem doesn't want. So what's more important? 
that the doctor that take care of you would like you, or the real doctor that gives us everything that we have would like you. What's more important? If you connected to the best doctors in the world, but the main one, the, the top switch, the top shelter is against you. You have 10 different switch, but the top one is off. What are they going to do? Nothing. Today, the next epidemic, it's the cancer disease that is going now to almost every family in the world. There's almost not one family in the world that doesn't have at least one among the brothers and the sisters and the cousins that is not chas v'shalom having this disease. In New York, every 10 minutes in average, I get a message on my text, please pray for this woman, please pray for this man, please. All cases, almost all of them, no cancer. So I'm, sometimes I'm, I'm just frozen already. I said to myself, wow, every 10 minutes a new name? Just me, one person. Every 10 minutes, another one, and another one, and another kid, and another woman, and another father to a few kids, and another woman. What's going on here? Is it coincidence? Something went wrong in the world? There are two ways to look at that. Albert Einstein once said, he wasn't exactly a big rabbi, but Albert Einstein said once something that every rabbi can use. What did he say? He said there are two ways to look at the world. One, that everything that happened in this world is a huge miracle. Or nothing is miracle. For the same thing that happened in the world, there are two different people. One say, everything is nature. The other one say, everything is miracle. What does the Torah say? What's the difference between miracle and nature? Who knows? I'll give you an example. One day, it's raining. Anybody care? No, people open their umbrella and walk. Next week, it's raining. Nobody gets excited. Why? It's already rained a thousand times in my life. What's the problem? Rain, you get wet a little bit, no big deal. What happens if tomorrow there will be red rain? Like blood. Everything red, the floor red, the cars is red. Everything you go, you're on the grass, it's all became red. You look at the world, it's all red. Red water are falling. What, what would happen in the world? The stock market in Wall Street will go from 16,000 points in one hour to 4,000 points. But the government will shut it after one hour because it will crush the entire United States and the whole world. So they shut it right away. People will kill themselves, they jump from terraces if they get wiped out. They have a hundred million dollar company, in less than an hour it became one million. What's the point of living? <laughs> they put all their life. It will be a disaster. People would think maybe it's an atomic nuclear war. No one would know what happened. People would hide in the basement, they will hide under the ground, they will... But that's only the first time. After a few hours when the world would see nothing really happen, Okay, so next week it rained again, red rain. What happened? Only 80% of the people are hiding. 20% have business meeting. They go on the street. Oh, Moshe, what are you doing? Look what's going on. Oh, last week nothing happened. I take my chances. The third time red rain would come, only 50% would hide. Everyone agreed that after 10 times, Everyone would walk in the street. Now imagine a person that was in a coma for one month. He opened up his eyes. And he, and he said, Mazal Tov, you can go to Maroho. So he goes out of the hospital and it begins to rain. Red rain. And he sees it. And he begins to scream, ah, Am I dead? Maybe it's the angel of death coming. And he see millions of people walk in the street. Nobody cares. Excuse me, what's going on? Leave me alone, I'm on the phone now. Nobody cares. So what really happened here? Why he get excited and they're not? Did something change in nature? Same nature. It's how frequent it is. 
When it's frequent, we call it nature. When it comes once in a blue moon, we call it a miracle. But there's really no difference at all. Do you know how many miracles happen in your body every minute? More than a million. Do you know what a miracle? I'll tell you, I'll give you one example. The heart is pumping blood to all over the body through the veins. So the blood has to send, the, the heart, it's a pump, has to send blood from here, from the valve, into the head, which is against gravity. But it cannot send too much blood, because then the brain would explode. Now the brain has 10 trillion connections, which means if you take all the telecommunication companies in the world, all wireless, all home phones, all internet, everything combined is not the brain of the dumbest person in the history still. That reminds me about a good joke. One nationality, I don't want to say which one, but known as very foolish people. So one guy his brain stopped to work. The doctor told him, Baruch Hashem, with the advanced technology we have today, I can send you to a specialist, a friend of mine. He sells brains. So he comes to the store. He said, listen, in one week they have to replace my brain. So my friend, the doctor, sent me to you. He say, you his friend. Can you offer me which brain to buy? So he say, yes. Here, this is a brain of a teacher. How much? Half a million dollars. He said, yeah? Brain of a teacher? Yeah. He said, what's this? He said, this is a brain, $750,000. He said, wow, what's so special about it? He said, this is an Israeli F-16 pilot. Sharp guy. Oh, OK. And what about this? One million dollars. He said, this is a brain of this kind of people. <laughs> so oh, why it's so expensive? He said, it's brand new. It's never taught before. <laughs> brand new. <laughs> no, it was never used. <laughs> brand new. <laughs> so anyway, so now, 10 trillion connection. The wires in a brain, if you take 1,000 of them, combine. It's like one hair from your head. Take one hair out, put it here, take a thousand from the brain combined. It's like one hair. So imagine how thin it is, the vessels. Now the blood that the brain sends has to go in all these vessels exactly in a milli, 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 milli liter, exactly to where it's supposed to go. Because if it will be a little bit more, Explosion, it's too thin. Coma, paralyzed. 70 years like this. Miracle or not miracle? Why no one is impressed? We got used to it. We got used to it. When is the first time you appreciate your eyes? When you see for the first time a blind person. Excuse me, senor, can you take me to the other side of the road? Wow, poor guy. He could have stayed here all night if I wouldn't come. Yeah, yeah, let me help you out. And you say, ah, when did I ever appreciate my eyes? One time I knew a guy, he lost a lot of money in a stock market. Millions. In one day. He was crushed. So I told him, let me ask you a question. If your daughter would put her finger inside the mixer, and it's automatically work and cut her finger off. And now you have to take the finger to the hospital to connect it, and they tell you it would cost you $5 million. But they'll fix the problem. Would you pay the money? He said, of course. And I say to him, and after you pay the money, would you feel bad or good? He said, I would feel great that I was able to do it. So I said, so why are you crying now about the $5 million? Hashem took it without cutting her finger. <laughs> So he looked at me, he said, you know what, I never thought about it. So I told him another story. I said, what? this is a true story. One guy went out of the shul, he crossed the street, 
the car came and hit him. He went to the hospital for one week. After a week, he came out, he has some cast here, you know, but he's alive, Baruch Hashem. So he decided to do Saudat Odaya in a shul, in the morning. So everyone is eating, what's the occasion? I almost died and Hashem made me a big miracle and I'm alive. The next day, another guy from the shul brought bagels, lax, cream cheese. He made another beautiful meal, some cerveza. So he said, what happened to you? You also got hit by a car? He said, no. 20 years I crossed these streets every day and I never got hit by a car. Why should I wait until it happens? Let me thank Hashem now. This is what Albert Einstein said. Sometimes you understand everything is miracle. You live with appreciation. And sometimes you take everything for granted. Why? Because you're ungrateful. That's all. Nothing else. Or you don't pay attention, or you're just ungrateful, one of the two. So Hashem said, if you're going to listen to me and live according to my rules, I will cure you. כל המחלה אשר שמתי במצרים לא אשים עליך כי אני השם רופאך. All the sicknesses that I put on the Egyptian in Egypt in a time of paro, I will not send to you. Why? Because I am your God, your doctor, your father. I'm not interested that my son will be sick. But if you're going to fight against me, if you write things against my Torah in the internet, if you steal all your life in a business, if you be mechalel Shabbat 50 years without saying one time thank you to me for everything I did to you, why are you surprised, God forbid, if one day you seek? Why are you surprised? It's exactly what the Torah said. It's not that you did not get warned. I warned you in my Torah. Why, and why you, oh, why Hashem did this to me? So I want to tell you one last thing for tonight. Hashem never did bad to any human being ever in a history. Ah, you tell me, what are you talking about? We saw so many people got punished in a history. The answer is nobody got punished. There's no punishments by Hashem, no punishment. There's only reality and illusion. That's it. What does it mean, reality? If I make fire here, fire now, and I put my hand inside for one minute. What happened to me? In best case scenario, I lose my hand for the rest of my life. Or my life. But I may lose only my hand. So the doctor will cut here, and I have only one hand for the rest of my life. If somebody else would come and put his hand into my fire, and now he lost his hand, can he say to his wife when he goes home that I punished him? If he comes to his wife, she says, what happened to you, Itzik? He say, Yosef punished me. He burned my hand. So his wife said, what a cruel guy he is. And then from now on, they begin to hate me. It's fair or not fair? Fair or not? No. No, of course not. No, of course not. I never burn him. I put fire here. I told him to come put his hand inside the fire. When Hashem said, don't do this, don't do that, be careful from this. If you do this, you would lose your eternity in the afterlife. And a person does it every day or every week. And one day he does pay the price. Hashem punished him or the person punished himself? Anyone here thinks that Hashem punished him, raise his hand. So why everyone blames Hashem for the problems? Ignorance. One last sentence for today, and I give you time for questions. There is a pasuk, a verse in the Tanakh. Ivelet Adam tesalef darko, ve'al Hashem izaf libo. The stupidity of the human being will turn him away from the right direction of God. And who is he going to blame in the end? God. Of course not. He's not going to blame himself. How many times you find a hero 
that come and say, ladies and gentlemen, don't feel bad for me. I deserve what I got. Don't blame Hashem. Hashem was very merciful with me. Most of the time, a person breaks his leg. He complains, why Hashem did this to me now? Six months like this. Why I broke my hand? Why I did this? Why, why don't you look at the rest of the body that God saved? Another inch would be that completely. He wants to focus on the negative. Focus on the positive, on a miracle you just had. How many people in accident smaller than this lost their life? It's all a matter of a free choice. Any questions about what we spoke and about what I did not speak, please now take advantage. Time is running out. Tomorrow night I fly back. Please don't forget to take CDs for you and for all your friends who did not come here tonight. Yes. I want to ask, what, what does it mean when Shh. a person got a big, big miracle and nothing bad happened to him when he got a big, big accident or something really bad happened? Okay, so I tell you something. When Hashem sent a person an accident, oh, the question is, what does it mean that a person had a very big accident and a huge miracle happened to him and nothing happened to him? Why Hashem did this? If Hashem didn't want him to get punished or to, do, to have any suffering, so why he did that accident to save him? The answer is, whenever an accident happens and a person doesn't get hurt, it's a warning from Hashem about the outcome. What can happen, what should have happened. However, Hashem wanted to show this person that there is one or more mitzvot that he did that saved him from that accident. Saved him from that accident. And that's like we have in the Torah, Tzedakat Atzil Mimavet, and many other examples in the Gemara, many, many stories of people who did something, and the Gemara show how it saved their life. So when it happens to a person, he has to do tshuva, 100% that, God forbid, the warning will not turn into reality. More questions? No, let's wake up. Yes. Mostly rabbis in all over the world, world are afraid to say the truth because they don't really do that. Oh, like so, you. yeah. So he says, why most of the rabbis he knows in the world are afraid to say some hard words from the Torah to warn the people about what they do. So let me explain to you something that is very common. People who speak in front of audience, when it's not coming to religion, they want to be popular. Whether it's in business, whether it's comedy, whether it's about training, whether it's a movie star, everyone who is speaking to an audience is interested to be more and more popular. If he's not getting popular, he gets frustrated. However, when a person speaks in the name of God, it's not his talent. It's not his knowledge. It's the knowledge of the book of the creator of the world. Many, many times he forget the mission. He's still thinking like all the other speakers, I want to be popular. And if I'm going to scare the people by telling them what the Torah speaks about their sins, the people won't like me. And then they won't come. Or at least half of them won't come. And then my lectures will be very small. And I have less listeners. So I'm actually going to hurt myself. As a popular speaker, I won't be popular. But the Torah already spoke about this. The Torah say. You don't have permission to modify my book. You have to say it as it is. But I will tell you one thing. I'll tell you one thing that you should know. Sometimes it's because of different reason. What is it? Money. Money. Why money? The nature of people is that they love money. For every 100 people, 99% love money. Here and there you find uh, some hippie that is in a mountain with his flute. He can be a millionaire, but he doesn't care. He wants to live simple life. You have like this in Israel, few guys. They don't care about their money. You have it all over the world, I, uh, I assume. But most people love money. Whether they do good thing with the money or not, that's another question. But they love money regardless. 
being strict with your audience, it's the number one damage to your fundraising. Nobody gives you donations, and I'm telling you from experience. I have tens of thousands of Baalei Tshuva, and I do the smallest fundraising perhaps in the whole world. Rabbis who started to speak a week ago already make more fundraising than me. Why? They tell the people what they like to hear. You're great, you're tzaddik, you're wonderful. Come to shul with the car on Shabbat. Everything is good. Poco, poco. Don't worry. So of course he like him. Wow, he said that I'm a tzaddik. Shh, $5,000 check. But when he say to him, hey, you wake up. You're destroying your future. Wake up. You're sinning. You're doing things that Hashem doesn't like. Even if he knows you say the truth, he's angry. He's not in the mood to write a check. That's why they're afraid to say it. But in the long run, one thing you should know. In the long run, it doesn't matter to how many people you spoke in your life. What only counts in the end is how many souls you saved. You can fill up stadiums with 10,000 people, and all of them go home with a smile. It was a beautiful show and a joke. Everyone is happy. Two people will become Shomre Shabbat. You can have 100 people instead of 10,000. Strong lecture. 20 became Shomer Shabbat. What do you think Hashem prepared? The beautiful show, 10,000, only two became Shomer Shabbat? <coughs> or 100 people and 20 became Shomer Shabbat? What do you think Hashem cared? We always have to remember what Hashem wants, not what we want. Yes? Can you explain a little more about when Moshiach comes? What's going to happen with the world? Is it going to end right away? Or what happens? There's different explanations and opinions about it. There's few different prophecies about what's going to happen when Mashiach comes. But one thing we have to know. The Rambam wrote, those prophecies, nobody would know how they will be until they would be. We will know a little bit. We know it's going to be a big war, Gog and Magog. We know according to one of the prophecies, two-thirds of the world will die immediately. According to the Zohar, will be 15 days of complete darkness, no sun. So there is different possibilities. Which one of the possibilities Hashem would do in the end, only He knows. There is also one possibility that millions of Jews would do tshuva, and not one bad thing would happen. The Mashiach would come, and the people would get saved, and everything would be beautiful. However, since we are now 24 years in the last quarter, the chance that this option will take place is less and less. Why? Because this was prior to schedule. Now we are already after the schedule. Most likely it won't happen, but I hope I'm wrong. Maybe there's still a chance. We'll see. What, what will happen with the boys? Oh, what would happen to the non-Jews when Mashiach come? First, Non-Jews, some of them righteous, some of them wicked. How a goy can be righteous? He has to keep seven laws that the Torah say to the goyim to keep. In reality, it's really 36 laws. I don't have time to explain now. It's seven major laws. But all together, it's about 36 laws. The laws of Noah. If the goyim keep it, they have heaven. If a goy died today, and he was keeping the laws of, that Hashem gave to Noah after the flood, this goy goes express to heaven. This is very sad that some of our brothers and sisters will not go there, and some strangers from different nations will go there, but this is the justice of Hashem. Same thing when Mashiach come. We have a clear verse in the Tanakh that the Jews that will survive will teach Torah to the goyim that survive. So it shows that the goyim will survive when Mashiach come. So chas v'shalom, some go Jews will not survive, but many Tonys and Vinis and Jose and Carlos will get saved. They will get saved because they listened to the laws of God, and they did what God told them. And some Jews did not care about the laws of God, and they lost their opportunity. I will finish with a short story to t that happened to me 20 years ago, and that will explain to you what the Torah is all about. 
One time, before I married my wife, we were dating. She worked for a fair company, very expensive fair coat company. She was in administration. One time, they gave her two tickets for a very fancy show in Manhattan in a place called the Rainbow Room. It's in a CBS building. Very fancy place. All the big shot singers come to sing there. $300 a ticket 20 years ago. It's like 600 today, each ticket. I did not know the singer, but I only knew that in those days I used to make $400 a week, and I just got two tickets worth $600. I have to go see what's happening there. <laughs> Out of curiosity. So we went to the show. I was 25 years old, young guy, only four years in America. We went to the show. I wore the leather jacket, a jeans, nothing fancy. She also wore casual. What are we going? We're going to see a show. We came to the show. I see all the limousines, all the Rolls Royce standing over there, and I had a little Nissan Maxima broken car like this. So I come in. I said, we don't belong here, but we already have the tickets. Let's see what's inside. So I come to the guy. I give him the ticket with a smile. Right away from his look, one thing I always had is good intuition. Right away, I smell problems. From his face, right away, I know something is going to go wrong now. The way he looked at me. So I give him the ticket. I, I'm thinking to myself quickly, what can go wrong? I have tickets. I cannot, I cannot tell me you're not going in. So he said to me, it looks like this. Now much like this it happened. Looks at me, look at the ticket. Uh, take a little flashlight. He's suspecting that it's fake. The tickets cannot be that this guy came to such a fancy show like this. Cannot be. It's only fancy people here. After he saw the ticket is real, he said to me, I'm very sorry, pal. In America, when they tell you, pal, you know there's problems. I'm very, it's like saying here, so, uh, sorry, muchacho. I'm very sorry. Why I'm sorry? I cannot let you in. I say, why? He say, you did not follow the conditions in the back of the ticket. He takes the flashlight and he shows me, you see? No sneakers, no jeans, no this, no that, no smoking, no, 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 a whole list over there. Black tie, bow tie. <laughs> so you see, you have the tickets, the way you dress, I cannot let you in. Why did I tell you now this story to end? Every Jew is born with this ticket from his mother wound. Call Israel Yeshlaim Chelek Laulam Abba. Shenemar Vamech Kulam Tzadikim Laulam Yershu Aretz Netzer Matai Maaseh Adai Lit Pair. But the problem is, that in the back of the ticket, there are conditions that Hashem wrote. Shabbat, rule number one. Without it, you cut yourself from my nation. Kosher food, rule number two. Not to be a thief. Always to dress modest. To learn Torah every day. Not to shave with a razor. Not to speak Lashon Araf. To keep the holidays. Not to worship idols. Not to do Chilul Hashem. To do Chesed. There's a list. But, but my mother is Jewish. Yeah. But what about the conditions? <coughs> and the Mishnah continues. And those are the Jews who has Shalom lost their share to the world to come. There's a list. We want to be able to leave this world that God forbid we are not in that list. We don't want to be in that black list. Because I promise you, as a brother and a lover of each one of you, to be in that list is the biggest tragedy in the history of this world. Much more than any tragedy you can imagine and remember. When a person had a ticket from God in his hand and from some foolish sins he lost it, he will pull his hair off and will suffer forever emotionally. I had it, and I blew it. 
Who wants to get to this situation? Do you know anyone? Nobody. So why so many people losing it? Ignorance and laziness. That's it. They just don't know how severe is the Torah. They like comedy. They like movies. They like illusions. They love money. They love vacation. They like $10,000 suits and a nice Bentley and a 20,000 square feet home. No, beseder. But what about the Torah? What about Emet? What about Hashem? What about the test? This is all doesn't, it's not important. So Bezrat Hashem, like I said to the girls today in the school, let's not wake up when it's too late. Let's not miss the train. Let's not miss the train. We have to get on a train to the right direction. And Bezrat Hashem, I want to thank each one of you who came on set here for two hours. And also special thank you to my dear friend Ariel Cohen and to the wonderful Rabbi Birch for organizing everything and bringing it with some other friends that I cannot remember all the list now. Everyone who helped, Hashem knows. My thank you, it's nothing. But Hashem, thank you, believe me. It's, it's worth a lot. So Bezrat Hashem, I will see you again in a few months, Bezrat Hashem. We have another uh, lecture tomorrow. Where tomorrow? Seven o'clock. Rabbi will make the announcement. Thank you very much. Thank you.